Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Feels like it's been a long time since I've been up here. If you look in your bulletins, what's the title of this message? I give you the permission to look in your bulletins and tell them what's the title of this message. Have you ever thought about that? The humiliation of God. Do you actually look at the titles of these sermons sometimes? Yes. Okay, thank you. Have you ever thought God could be humiliated? Do you realize that that is what separates Christianity from every other religion on this earth? It is the center point of Christianity is the humiliation of its God. Think about that. Have you ever been humiliated? Do you know what that feeling is like? Is there a difference between humility and humiliation? Are you able to explain what the difference is? So, that's very good. Did you hear what she said? Can you say it loud? of humility in the dictionary is the quality or state of not thinking more uh, hold on the quality of state of not thinking you are better than other people it's a quality of being courteously respectful of others it's the opposite of aggressiveness arrogance and vanity the definition of humiliation is an act or instance of being humiliated or a state or feeling of mortification. It's also to be reduced to lowliness or submission. When you think of God, do you ever think of God in those terms? Humility, but humiliation? Let me ask you this, at the cross, was Jesus humiliated? Yes. yes. And was it done on purpose. Yes. And did God say, this is what I'm going to do to save the world? Think about that. Because it gives you an insight into the heart of this God that we serve. In this life, hi Gary, what's, what's going on? Well, I just want to make a comment. When okay. It was appropriate. Oh, I thought there was a problem with like no. my mic or something. No. I was thinking, you know, what you're talking about, humiliation and how about self, total self-giving of himself. That is the encapsulation of Jesus Christ. What he actually did, what he showed, what he accomplished in the 33 and a half years that he was here on this earth. But this morning what I want you to think about is I want you to think about God. When you think about God, what kind of mental picture comes into your mind? What is your view of the creator of heaven and earth? And is humiliation part of that? Because God loved you so much that he left heaven and all of that glory and all of that power and all that prestige to come here and learn and understand humiliation. Are you willing to do that for somebody that you love? God was willing to do it for somebody who was his enemy. That's the kind of God we serve. You understand that the cross stripped away any mask that we could put on God. Because it showed him for who he really and truly is. And that is a God of love. Undying, unselfish, unbridled love. <clears throat> I want you to think about 
the worst time in your life that you've been humiliated. And how that made you feel. I want you to have that thought in your mind. And ask yourself, would you like to do that again? Would you like to feel that again? Now, the reason why I asked you the difference between humble and humility and humiliation is that humbleness is a state of being. This is what we, from the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, this is what God has called us to be. We need to be humble. Is that right? Yes. The Bible tells us that God does what to the proud? He resists the proud. So if we are to come to God, we are to come to God in humbleness and also humility. Is that right? Also, as we deal with each other on a sometimes day-to-day -day or in a church setting, a week-to-week -week basis, we need to come to each other in humility, right? In humbleness. This is what the Bible teaches us as well. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 12. And let's look at verses 1 through 3. Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. Linda, can you read verse 1 for me? Therefore, therefore since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily <coughs> entangles us, and let us run with endurance the rays that was set before us. So verse 1 tells us a couple of things. One, that we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. And since we have this great cloud of witnesses, those who have walked this road, traveled this path, have lived Christianity, and they have been successful, and they have been victorious, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses, then there are things we ought to do. What are those things? One... We should lay aside every weight and encumbrance. And what's that next phrase? What does it say here to do? And the, sin, the sin. and the sin that so easily what? Or besets us. So what is the scripture telling us here? That we are to do with sin. Are we to continue in it? Are we, are to, are we to say sin is too powerful. I'm too weak. I have no victory. What is that scripture telling you? The scripture is telling you that you are not the first one that has walked this path and that those who come before you have walked it in victory and since they have, they've given you a witness. And since they've given you a witness, you too can have victory. What are we to do? Lay aside this sin that's so easily besets us and ensnares us. Any idea what that sin is? Self. Say it, Chuck, please. You've got something on Say it. Self. There's multiple answers to that. Because there are specific sins that so easily beset me that may not beset you and ensnare me, that may not ensnare you. But the one thing that besets us all is the sin of unbelief. Amen. Let's set that sin aside because if you can't set that sin aside, no other sin is ever going to be laid aside. Amen? Amen. Right? Does that make sense to you? Amen. In your own flesh, do you have power to conquer sin? No. So, who is it that actually gives you victory over sin? And the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, right? But if you don't believe, how will that ever happen? So belief is the foundation block that you build on for this teaching that we're going to talk about today. And when we talk about this, what I want you to keep in your mind is the humiliation of God. What God went through so that we could stand here today and be here in this church and talk about the love of God, the power of Christ, and victory over sin. Amen? Amen. Amen.
Are we alone in this? Are we the only ones who've ever had to deal with this? The scripture says that we are surrounded by what? A great cloud of witnesses. So that was verse 1. It also tells us that we are to lay aside the sin which so easily besets us or ensnares us and let us, what? Run, run, run. run with endurance the race that is set before us. In my experience, what I know to be true, I need to make sure I phrase this right. From my experience, what I see in others and what I see in myself is that what I lack is endurance. When things are going well, I have plenty of endurance. Why? Because things are going well. But when things aren't going well, and I'm wondering where God is and when He's going to show up, I find that my endurance is really, really low. What is the definition of endurance? Any ideas? The ability to sustain oneself. Carl, thank you, because I didn't look that one up and write it down. So thank you very much. I like that definition. We're told to continue to run this race and to run it with endurance. When I find myself weak and lacking endurance, what I know to be true is that I'm in a state of unbelief because I'm not trusting God to do what God has promised. Does God fulfill His promises? Yes. If you were to rate it from a percentage scale of 0 to 100%, is it 50% of the time He fulfills His promises? No. What did you say? No. 100%. Does God fulfill His promises 100% of the time? Yes. So when my endurance is low and my faith is weak, it's not because God isn't faithful. It is because I have gotten into a spirit of unbelief. Because I'm not trusting God. So the question is, is when you get to that point, what do you do? Have you ever been to that point, Lennon? What do you do? <laughs> it depends. What I have found in my experience is what Linda said. If I don't fall on my knees, then I fall. Mm -hmm. So either way, you're going to fall, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the question is, is which way do you want to fall? Do you want to fall on your knees? Or do you want to fall beneath that rock, which will crush you? Is that right? Jesus said that that rock will crush you and will grind you into powder. One of the things that continues to bring me to my knees is the love of God. Amen. When I don't understand what He's doing in my life, when I don't understand why He hasn't showed up, when I think He should, when I can't see, not just today, when I can't see the next 20 minutes and I'm wondering what's going on and I need something and help now. What I've learned is that God in His love and His mercy uses these times in my life to help me to get out of unbelief and bring me to a spirit of belief. How do I do that? by letting go of my unbelief and thinking that I've got to solve this problem and I've got to solve it now and actually getting on my knees and saying, God, I will actually do what your word says and I will wait for you and I will wait on you. And you know what? God doesn't show up in the next 30 seconds. Every time, 100%, God waits because he's testing the validity of my cry. Mm -hmm. 
And 100% of the time, when I fully and completely give my heart to Christ and wait on Him, He shows up. Amen. And He does the work that I could never do myself. And He brings me to the point of submission. Humiliation. And I'm okay with that. Because I find in my own flesh this battle that I do not like humiliation. I don't like to be humiliated. I like to pretend humbleness. You guys ever do that? Pretend humbleness? Yeah. I can fake that really well. But you can't fake it with God. And if you want to come to God, you got to come to God on His terms. And when I look at the cross, and I see what Jesus did for me there. When I see that what Jesus did, the Father was doing as well. And what the Father was doing, the Holy Spirit was doing. So the entire Godhead was there at that place in time in earth's history, humiliating themselves so that I can be saved. Humiliating themselves so that I can stand. Not in my own power but in the power of the living Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Alright. So turn back with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the what? I love this word. <laughs> What does that word author mean? So right in that text, you see the start and the finish, right? The beginning and the end. Who starts your faith journey? Is it you? It's the Holy Spirit calling and compelling you. And you see what God has done for you. And so you reach out to God with your heart. And he begins a process of changing you. And that process takes your entire life. But the great thing about God is, I know people that have died in their teens, and I know people that died in their hundreds. God is the author and the finisher of their faith. So wherever they were at, God did a work in them that will bring them into eternity. Amen? Amen. Looking, into the G looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, what's that next word? Endure. Endured the cross. Now, this next word, I've always found strange. What does your Bible say the next word is? Okay. What does it mean that he despised the shame? He endured the cross, but he despised the shame. What does that mean? I, I, he didn't like it, right? What does it mean to despise something? It means you don't like it. You don't like it vehemently. You don't like it. What was it that kept him there? Did he not say that at this time I could call to my father and he would send me how many legions? Okay. Did Jesus have to stay on the cross? No. Did Jesus have to go to the cross? No. He had freedom of choice just like you and I. But what made him choose to go to the cross? He endured the cross, despised the shame, because he realized that the shame had no power over him. Do you guys understand that? He said, humiliate me all that you can. Do your best, because I will despise that shame because of the joy set before me. What's the joy? The joy is seeing your face in heaven. 
You guys understand that? Amen. So when my faith is lacking, when I get into that spirit of unbelief, I look to the cross and I look to Christ and I see if God was willing to humiliate himself for me, and I am so unworthy. And he despised that shame and said, bring it on so that I could be there with him. What else can I do? Except get on my knees and say, Father, forgive me. Restore me. Live in me. I want to know this God. I want to have a relationship with this Christ. Amen. Linda. I like the Go ahead. That's okay, yes. <laughs> That's okay. Humiliation. When I was in school, they make you stand up in front of the class and read. You guys remember that? How many of you were good readers? Raise your hand. Raise them high so everybody can see. Okay, that's a that's that's not the majority. That's that's a minority. How many of you were fair readers? Raise your hand. Yeah. How many of you were poor readers? Raise your hand. Okay, how many of you are poor readers with a speech impediment? Raise your hand. Okay, so the first time I had to get up in front of the class and, and read, you stand there and all the eyes are looking at you. And you know before you even get up, this is not going to be good. But you have to do it. And you sit in your seat and the teacher calls your name and you pretend you don't hear her. <laughs> that doesn't work. She continues to call your name, so you drop your book and pretend you still didn't hear her. And then she moves to your desk and actually brings you to the front because it's your turn to read. And you know this is not going to be good. And you know your friends are looking at you and they're laughing because they know it's about to come. And you start to sweat. And you start to get really nervous and your legs are shaking and your knees are shaking and your entire body is shaking. But have any of you ever sweat blood in that situation? No. no. In the Garden of Gethsemane, did Jesus sweat blood? Yes. Why? Do you understand when it tells you and it gives you that insight that he sweated blood? the mental anguish and turmoil that he was going through as he was continuing to make this decision of whether he would be the Lamb of God that truly will take away the sin of the world. That as the weight of sin started to come upon him and he started to understand the darkness and the separation that sin causes between us and God. Do you understand why we sin so easy? It's because we don't understand that separation. Do you understand that the one who does was sinless? He knew no sin but took my sin so that I who do not know righteousness can know righteousness. That I who have no claim to God, to heaven, to be a child of God. Jesus made a way so that I can now be a child of God. That I now have access to the Father and I have access to eternal life in heaven. When he sweated blood, he sweated blood because he saw your face and my face and he was wondering in his humanity, can I deal with this? But I believe that your, your face popped up, and my face popped up, and that joy that was set before him, which is you and I, and a universe that is untouched by sin, that was enough to say, I'll go, and I'll die, and I'll pour out my entire being
looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, has sat down at the right hand of God, or the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such, what's that next word? Hostility. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become, what? All right. This Christian walk is going to be the hardest thing you've ever done in your entire life. But it will be the most joyful, the most fulfilling, and if you're in Christ, the most rewarding and the easiest thing you have ever done. Because is it you doing it, or is it God doing it in you? Amen. Amen. Now listen. When Jesus was in Gethsemane, why did he sweat blood? Because he had to make a choice of what he was going to do. God does these things for you, and he will do these things in you, but you have to choose to let him. Does that make sense? The Bible says plainly, choose ye what? This day what? Who you will serve. Right? Jesus is the author and the finisher of your faith. He is the Alpha, the Omega. What is that? The beginning and the end. The psalm says Jesus paid it all. But you have to choose whether you will serve him or whether you will not. In this world and in this universe, now let's just go with this world. In this fallen world, there's only two sources of power. Did you know that? Two sources of power. What are those two sources of power? Good and evil. Good and evil. One is God and the other is the devil. There is no fence between them. You are either in God's camp, and if you're not, then whose camp are you in? This is the difference between Satan and God. Satan doesn't have to play by any rules at all. Satan doesn't care how you come to him. 